Three weeks ago, we began this series called The Visited Planet. It is a celebration of Jesus Christ, his life, his ministry, his death, and his resurrection. On the first Sunday of April, Pastor Albert Clavo shared a message called Saved. Sin is the disease, Jesus is the cure, salvation is the result. On Resurrection Sunday, Pastor Giorgio Baldo preached a message called Risen, where he cautioned us about the slippery slope of hopelessness, disappointment, disillusionment, discouragement, defeat, and death. We were assured that when we are overwhelmed by pain, God's presence comforts us. We were reminded that even in the face of challenges, God's Word anchors us and keeps us secure in faith. Last Sunday, Brother Peter Kairos encouraged us with a message called Commissioned. We learned about the four key elements that sustain our faith in Jesus Christ and our passion for the Great Commission. His authority, His purpose, his strategy, and his abiding presence. Today, we will be ending this series with a message called Anointed. If you have your Bibles, please turn to Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. We will be reading from the New American Standard Bible. The first account I composed, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up to heaven after he had by the Holy Spirit given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. To these he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. Gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which he said, you heard of from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Verse 6, so when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest part of of the earth. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Before we consider the consequences and the practical implications of what it means to be anointed, let us consider briefly what the Bible says about anointing. In the Old Testament, in the language of the Old Testament, Hebrew, the word that is interpreted, translated, anoint is mashak, from where we get the word Messiah. It means to smear, to rub, or to spread oil on someone or something. The first significant mention of anointing in the Old Testament happens in the time of Israel wandering about in the wilderness. God commands Moses to anoint Aaron and his sons with oil, to ordain them, to consecrate them as priests before the Lord. Saul, David, and Solomon were all anointed as kings over Israel. Later on, when the kingdom is divided into two, Joash is anointed as king over Judah. David Interestingly, he's anointed three times. The first time in the presence of his father, Jesse, before his brothers. The second time after the death of Saul, when the tribe of Judah comes and asks 
David to be their king and he is king over Judah only ruling from Hebron for about seven and a half years. And then after the death of Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, who is assassinated, the leaders of the tribes of Israel come to David and ask him to be king over all of Israel, and David becomes king. Solomon, his son, is anointed twice, first by Zadok the priest, and then in First Chronicles by the entire assembly. We also study in the Old Testament that when Samuel anointed King Saul, he anointed him with oil from a flask, the Hebrew word pak. But when he anoints David and eventually when Zadok anoints Solomon, they are both anointed with oil from a horn. In the Old Testament, horn, karen, is the symbol for power. In the New Testament, oil is the symbol for the anointing of the Holy Spirit. If we study the Old Testament, it was not always priests and prophets anointing people. Absalom is anointed by his followers who supported his rebellion against his father, David. Jehoahaz, the son of King Josiah, was anointed by the people of the land as king over Judah after the death of Josiah in his war with Pharaoh Necho of Egypt. It was not just people that were anointed. Sometimes inanimate objects are anointed too. Jacob running away from his brother, going towards Padanaram to his uncle's home, comes to a place in the middle of nowhere, and when the sun sets, takes a stone, makes it his pillow, and falls asleep. And while he's sleeping, he has this magnificent dream of a ladder that is resting on earth, reaching all the way to heaven, and the angels of God going up and down the ladder. The next morning when he wakes up, he's terrified. He takes the stone that was his pillow the night before, pours oil over it, and makes a vow before the Lord. When God mentions that, a few chapters later, God uses the word anointing. So it's not just people that are anointed, it's also inanimate objects. In the book of Exodus, we study that the Lord commands Moses to make a special concoction with oil and fragrant spices, the details of which God specifically gives to Moses. They're supposed to make this anointing oil and anoint the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, the ark of the covenant, the table of showbread, the golden lampstand, the altar of incense and the offering, and the laver. So it's not just people that are anointed, it's also stones and tabernacles that are anointed. When we come to the New Testament, the equivalent word for mashak is Christos, from where we get the word Christ or the anointed one. The prophets of the Old Testament and the prophecies of the Old Testament, the messianic prophecies of the Old Testament, they all have identified Jesus as the Messiah of God. So in the New Testament, Jesus is called the Christ, the anointed one, the chosen one. After Jesus was baptized... Luke tells us a story in chapter 4, verses 16 through 19, that while Jesus was visiting his hometown of Nazareth, on a Sabbath day, as was his custom, Jesus went to the synagogue, and when he stood up to read, they handed him a scroll of the book of Isaiah. Jesus looked through the scroll, found what he was looking for, and he began to read, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. 
Luke then goes on to tell us that after reading, Jesus handed over the scroll to the attendant and sat down, and the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fixed on Jesus. As every eye was transfixed on the Messiah of God, Jesus spoke and said, Today, in your hearing, this scripture has been fulfilled. Jesus understood his anointing. He understood his anointing absolutely and completely. No one before him and no one after him had such a comprehensive grasp of their anointing. Jesus understood his anointing. He knew what his anointing demanded of him in life. It is for this reason Jesus says in John chapter 4 and 34, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Yes, Jesus understood his anointing. This was his marching order from his heavenly father. His prime directive to be faithful to that which his father has called him to do. His awareness of his anointing was complete. He was not confused. He did not have second thoughts. He did not consult with anyone other than his heavenly father. He was not distracted. The devil tried to distract Jesus immediately after his 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness fasting and praying. He was not swayed by the devil's offer to satisfy his hunger. He was not swayed by the empty promises of hollow power. He was not swayed by the misuse of his anointing. He rebuked the devil using the word of God in the power of his anointing. And the devil left him and angels came to minister to Jesus. He had a thorough understanding of his anointing. He needed no one to remind him of who he was and what he was called to do. Jesus understood his anointing. As the anointed one, Jesus did not allow himself to be seduced by any other mandate other than the mandate given to him, entrusted to him by his heavenly father. It is for this reason when Jesus was baptized, the heavens were torn apart. Mark uses the word. And a voice affirmed the anointing of God's only son. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Yes, Jesus understood his anointing. He had a comprehensive grasp of his anointing. He was committed to his anointing even if he knew that someday this anointing would ultimately lead him to death, excruciatingly painful death on a cross. The cross does not scare Jesus. It, it, it does not force him to look any other way. Jesus, with steadfast commitment to his God-given calling, says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. John chapter 12, verse 24. He was willing to sow his sinless life into death on the cross of obedience so that in his obedient suffering and in his obedient death, we who believe in him might reap an undeserving eternal reward. This is the fruit of Jesus' awareness and obedience to his anointing. No, he was not confused. He was not distracted. He knew who his father was and he knew who he was. Jesus did not have an identity crisis. 
He did not need to pull a piece of paper out of his pocket to remind him, this is who you are and this is what you are supposed to do. He knew it every day and he was committed to it. Jesus the Christ, the anointed one, the chosen one, he understood his anointing and he embraced it eagerly. So this Jesus, who was anointed by the Father, promises us the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, who also would anoint us with his power. In Luke chapter 24, verse 49, Jesus says, And behold, I am sending forth the promise of my Father upon you, speaking to the disciples. But you are to stay in the city, Jerusalem, until you are clothed from power, with power from on high. This is not a periodic, occasional, temporary visitation. This is going to be a rich experience of the indwelling Holy Spirit of God. This is a promise he makes his disciples. That brings us to the question, what does the Holy Spirit anointing accomplish in life? First, we are anointed to be bold and effective as witnesses for Jesus Christ. Perfect example is Peter who denies Jesus three times, cursing even toward the end. The same Peter, after he is filled with the Holy Spirit, when people come looking for him and ask him, Are you Peter? He boldly says, Yes, I am. The fear that tormented Peter his whole life has been erased by the presence of the Holy Spirit which has emboldened him to stand up and to face certain death. The Holy Spirit anoints us to be bold and effective witnesses for Jesus Christ. In the passage we are studying today, Acts chapter 1, verses 4 and 5 and verse 8, we are told, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses. Where? In Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the remotest parts of the world. We will not just be content sharing the gospel in our comfort zone. We will abandon our comfort for the cause of Christ and boldly bearing this anointing of the Holy Spirit. We will wander off to unknown places to share the gospel to unknown peoples across the world. The Holy Spirit makes us bold. He also makes us effective. He empowers us to speak with conviction and confidence. Two, we are anointed to live a life that is consecrated, set apart unto God. In Romans chapter 12, verse 1, the Apostle Paul says, Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. In the Old Testament, anything set aside for God was not used for any other purpose. The utensils of the tabernacle, the equipment in the tabernacle, the utensils in the temple of Solomon, these utensils were only used for sacred purposes. You could not borrow them to throw a feast in your backyard. You could not borrow them to add to the utensils in the king's home. When foreign dignitaries came, that gold and that silver belonged to God and it must stay in the temple because these were consecrated vessels for service and for worship. 
It is from that idea we take the idea of consecration as we give in to the sanctifying grace of God's Holy Spirit. God empowers us to live a life that is so distant from sin, so separated from the evil and the brokenness of this world that we stand set apart for God, consecrated, branded for God. He belongs to God. She belongs to God because God has anointed this brother, this sister to stand for him, for his name, for his cause, and for his great commission. The Holy Spirit empowers us to live a sanctified life, to pursue holiness as God's standard of living for our lives, to be consecrated, set apart, separate from everyone and everything because we have only one desire to please God and to walk in a manner worthy of our Heavenly Father. Three, the anointing gives us the power of the Holy Spirit. We're anointed to live and to move in the power of the Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 8 verse 5, the Apostle Paul writes, Those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things, but those who are controlled, those who are anointed, those who are led, those who are moved, those who are directed by the Holy Spirit, think about the things that please the Spirit. If our heart longs for God, we would not satisfy ourselves, pleasing ourselves or something else in the world. Our sole desire would be to please our Heavenly Father who called us out of darkness into His marvelous light. So the Holy Spirit makes us bold and effective witnesses for Jesus. We're anointed to live a consecrated life and we're anointed to live and move in the power of God's Holy Spirit. Eager ambition, passionate aspiration cannot compensate for the gift of the Holy Spirit. They cannot mimic, they cannot replicate, they cannot imitate, they cannot replace the supernatural power that comes through the anointing of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's power is unlike any other we have known. And when He saturates us with His holy presence, we become something we never have been. We are delivered from our own problems, our own weaknesses, and called to live a life that glorifies God. More often than not, Sadly, we are more interested in the manifestations of the power that comes with the anointing rather than pursuing the life of holiness that is demanded as we desire the anointing of the Holy Spirit. The reason some of us crave the gift or the gifts of the Spirit is because the gift or the gifts of the Holy Spirit usher us into the limelight. They establish our reputation before the church. They create prominence. They make us privileged. They give us spiritual pedigree. They help us cut to the front of the line. And so we are thirsty and hungry and greedy. And we collect the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Not to glorify God, but we collect them in the same manner we collect everything in life. Magnets on a refrigerator, knickknacks on the mantelpiece, paintings on the wall, cars in the garage, horses in the stable, blue chip stock in your portfolio, 
and properties scattered around the world. We think the power of the Holy Spirit, it's something to be collected and hoarded and shown off to everyone so that our status quo in the kingdom of God dramatically rises. We keep seeking the gift and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. But here's the truth. When we parade the gifts that come with our anointing before the world and expend all our efforts to draw attention to ourselves, there is the inherent danger of us turning the gift of the Holy Spirit into an idol. You're not really interested in fellowship with God, His Son, and the Holy Spirit. You just want the fringe benefit. The acquisition. The possession so as to boast to someone. So we seek the gifts of the Holy Spirit so that we can draw attention to ourselves. That is not what Holy Spirit anointing is for. It is not so that a Christian can broadcast his name. The anointing is given to us so that we live for only one thing, for God and His glory. So when we collect the gift and we have no other use for the gift other than to show off to another brother or a sister, then we run the risk of turning this gift into an idol and start a new form of idolatry, a more dangerous form of idolatry. Why our gift no longer serves God or His purpose? It no longer seeks to glorify His name because we have subverted it and we have turned it into glorifying our name. In our pride and in our greed, we misuse the gift and therefore abuse the power that comes with the anointing. Listen carefully. When we abuse the power that gives us the anointing, We commodify the anointing that gives us the power. When we abuse the power that comes with the anointing, we commodify the anointing that gives us the power. We cheapen it. We desecrate it. And God is not pleased with us. He's not pleased because we have abused his gift to create for ourselves an engraved pedestal so that we may climb upon it and manifest the Lucifer spirit seeking equality with God. It's a dangerous game to play And the one we will eventually lose, and miserably so. The purpose of the anointing is not so that we may show off the gift, but that we may dwell in the beauty of God's holiness. Soaking up God's goodness and mercy all the days of our life. When this happens... When we abuse the power that comes with the anointing, not only are we in danger of losing the gift, there is also the danger of this gift, which is supposed to be a blessing, to become a curse over our life. One thing is very clear. When God anoints us, He anoints us for His purpose. The gift or the gifts that God generously invests in us through His Holy Spirit are first and foremost to accomplish the purposes of God and to glorify His name and to edify His church. It is for this reason 
we see that the anointed men of the Old Testament lived impoverished lives. They were persecuted and killed. They did not live comfortable lives. Their anointing gave them no comfort other than the satisfaction, the supreme satisfaction that my life obeys the will of God and moves in the anointing of His Holy Spirit. So the prophets, when they spoke, the Spirit of the Lord... They professed it. Thus says the Spirit of the Lord. And when they were done saying what God wanted them to say before people would be confused whether this is God's word or the prophet's word, they would end it by saying, Thus says the Spirit of the Lord. Everything else is mine. That is from the Lord. They did not try to hog the glory. They gave all glory to God and paid the ultimate price for that. They died. We see this in the New Testament too. When, we, when in obedience to God's word, we submit to God's sanctifying grace and consecrate our lives, God anoints us and we receive his gifts. Some of us one, some of us more than one. But when we abuse this gift, only deep repentance can restore our relationship with God. There are two souls in Scripture, prominent ones. One in the Old Testament, one in the New Testament. King Saul's life is a perfect illustration. Once he was filled with the Spirit, but because he was jealous of David, and because he did things he was not supposed to do, and he did not do the things he was supposed to do, and because as king he was more eager to satisfy his army than to please God who anointed him as king over Israel, the kingdom and the anointing were stripped away from Saul. Both the kingdom and the anointing went to David, a man who chased after God's own heart. The greater tragedy is when the Holy Spirit, when the Spirit of the Lord left Saul, an evil spirit of depression and sadness replaced it. In the emptiness created by the vacating Holy Spirit, another spirit, a lesser spirit, an evil spirit, a foul spirit, a depression spirit, took up the place. And Saul was a tormented man. He began so well, he ended so poorly. To start so well, to have so much and to lose everything all because of greed and pride. What a sad story. On the other side, we have the other Saul. One we have come to love and admire as the Apostle Paul. Saul too had a different kind of power. It came, it came with the endorsement of religious authorities. And Saul drank deep from this shallow pool of conceit muddled by pride and prejudice. And he sought to destroy Christians. As God's will would have it, one day in his murderous desire to persecute Christians, as he was on the road, Saul fell off his horse and right into the sufficient grace of God. Who with a question transformed Saul's life. 
He exchanged the power that came from letters of appointment given by man to walk in the power of God that came with the anointing of God's Holy Spirit. But Paul understood the purpose of the anointing. He was more gifted than anyone else we know. God invested more spiritual gifts in Paul. He could boldly say, I speak in tongues more than anyone else. And he had the authority to tell people eagerly desire spiritual gifts. Ask God for prophetic ability. But Paul understood this gift is not so that Paul would make his name great. It's so that Paul would make known the name of God and preach the gospel that is the power of God unto salvation, even if it is the message of foolishness to those that are perishing. Paul understood the purpose of the anointing. So he writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. That was the secret of the Apostle Paul's anointing. He knew he could not be selfish with it. He knew he could not make himself great with it. He understood all that is invested in him is not for his glory, but for the glory of God who has given him that power. And who has called him to be an apostle according to the express will of God our Father. What is the Holy Spirit saying to us today? What is the message from the Word of God? Seek the gift. Seek more than one gift. Ask the Holy Spirit to invest a gift or many gifts in you. But also seek that the presence of the Holy Spirit will enable you to bear much spiritual fruit. When we ask for a gift, our gift glorifies God and edifies us. But when we are filled with the fruit of the Spirit, as we read in Galatians, Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, and more importantly, self-control. You see, you can impress someone with your gift, but your life can transform another with the fruit. The sad reality of the church of God in modern times is we are so preoccupied with the gifts to show them off that we have completely ignored the fruit of the Spirit. Do you desire the presence of God's Holy Spirit to indwell in your life so that you may live an empowered and victorious Christian life? Good! Get on your knees, cry your heart before God, and seek the gift of the Holy Spirit. But while you're seeking to be anointed by God's Holy Spirit, also seek the fruit of the Spirit. Gift edifies us, glorifies Christ. Fruit edifies the entire body of Jesus Christ. I would rather be surrounded by godly men and women that have many fruit than many gifts. I might be impressed by their many gifts, but I'm transformed by their many fruit. 
Their love, their joy, their peace, their patience, they transform me. If I see the manifestation of their gift, I go home impressed. But if I experience authentic ministry as an overflow, as an outlet of their spiritual fruit, the fruit of the Spirit, I go home wanting to be like this brother who is more patient than I am, this sister who is more joyful than I am. Let's change the world, not just with the gift of the Holy Spirit. Let's change our families, our communities, our churches, our nation, this whole world by asking God, Lord, sanctify me, consecrate me so that I'm not just filled with the gift of the Holy Spirit, but my life there's all the fruit of the Spirit, every single one, one by one or all at once. I would like to end with this thought. It is easy to love being the anointed one. It is very difficult to live like the anointed one. I would like to be anointed. That is easy. I want to live in the anointing of God's Holy Spirit. That is difficult. If you love the anointing, great. But do you live the anointing that you so desperately love? If our sole desire is to glorify God in all areas, in everything in our life, then we must not just love the anointing of the Holy Spirit. We must intentionally, with deep devotion, with single-minded pursuit, with unashamed desire, Seek to live the life of an anointed one. Can we do this? Yes. How do we know we can do this? Jesus, the anointed one, is our role model. He's our example. And Jesus, who knows how to do the will of his Father, who sent him, through the promise of His Spirit, will empower us, anointing us, leading us into a deeper, richer, sanctified, consecrated life so that our lives might be a living sacrifice. Acceptable unto God. And as we pursue the gift of and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And as we seek God to nurture in us, to nourish, to foster, to develop, to grow in us the fruit of the Spirit, we should continually pray and ask God that He would use us in His power and in His might to be a bold and effective witness, to be a consecrated disciple, to live and move in the power of His Holy Spirit.